Hello and welcome to Lesson 18 of 20 in the URSA Campus Breakdown course on Introductory Statistics and Probability. This is Module 4, Introduction to Inferential Statistics, Part 4, Hypothesis Testing Concerning Sample Means and Proportions Comparing Two Populations. Let's get started. The preceding lesson introduced the concepts and processes involved in conducting hypothesis tests about parameters from single populations. In this lesson, we extend these ideas to using hypothesis tests to make decisions based upon comparisons between two populations. The topics covered in this lesson include random samples and comparisons between two populations, hypothesis tests comparing two population means for independent samples and for paired samples, and hypothesis tests comparing two population proportions. Two lessons ago, we examined how sampling methods can be used to estimate the differences in parameters such as mean and proportion between two different populations. The reasons for using confidence intervals to make such estimates we discussed were to be able to address questions such as, for example, are house prices on average the same in two different towns? Or does a certain brand of decaffeinated coffee have an overall effect on the heart rate of people who drink it? it or is there a difference between the germination rate of two different sources of lettuce seeds? Our consideration of confidence intervals brought us to a point where we could, using sample data, calculate estimates for differences in such population parameters to prescribe levels of confidence. The overarching question that remains for us to address, however, is how can we use the sample data to make important decisions about whether the differences we inevitably see between samples are indicative of real differences between the populations, or whether these are just the result of random sampling error. As we did in the previous lesson with single samples, in this lesson we will employ a similar overall process with respect to comparing samples. The essential underlying question is the same. Are the differences that we obtain from sampling large enough to signal that they are statistically significant or not? We now examine how this question is answered for population means, both independent and paired samples, and population proportions. We begin by looking at a hypothesis test where we test the null hypothesis that the difference between two population means, mu1 minus mu2, equals some hypothesized difference, which we'll call mu1 minus mu2 naught. The hypotheses for the test in general are as follows, and this is, this is in some ways similar to the test that we were looking at in the previous lesson for single populations. We see that the two-tailed test shows that the null hypothesis H0 is that mu1 minus mu2 is equal to mu1 minus mu2 naught, which is the hypothesized difference, whereas the alternative hypothesis HA is that mu1 minus mu2 is not equal to that value. And then the one tail tests left or right are as follows. The left tail test has HA being that mu1 minus mu2 is less than the hypothesized value, whereas the H0 is that mu1 minus mu2 is greater than or equal to the hypothesized value. And then opposite for the right tail test, HA is that mu1 minus mu2 is greater than the hypothesized value, so H0 is that mu1 minus mu2 is less than or equal to the hypothesized value. The hypothesized difference between the population means can be any value. The most common hypothesized difference, however, is zero. In other words, this type of hypothesis test is usually conducted in order to determine whether or not two populations actually have the same mean. For this course, we will focus exclusively on this type of test with the hypothesized difference equal to zero. 
For differences between the mean of independent populations, then, the hypotheses we'll be working with are as follows. And they're basically the same ones. You see them um, in below in the slide. Uh, and they're similar to the ones that we just talked about um, a few moments ago. The only difference is we replace mu1 minus mu2 naught with the value of 0. As with confidence intervals for differences between population means using independent samples, we use the t distribution and the corresponding test statistic is as follows. t obtained is equal to x bar 1 minus x bar 2 over the square root of s1 squared over n1 plus s2 squared over n2. And we compare this to t critical which, which TC with degrees freedom equal to the minimum of N1 minus 1 and N2 minus 1. We now look at examples of this type of hypothesis test. In example one, we return to the example from a previous lesson in this module where we were comparing house resale prices in two towns with the following sample data obtained. And you see the table there comparing the samples for house resale prices in Palooka Town and Smallville. In A, part A asks that assuming that this sample data is collected in order to test the claim that there is no actual difference between the average resale values in the two towns, use the critical value method to make a decision about this claim at LOC equals 95%. Assume that house resale values in these towns tend to follow a roughly normal distribution. Part B asks us to repeat part A for LOC equal to 99%. In part C, we're asked to show that 95% and 99% confidence intervals for the difference in the two towns average house resale prices confirm the results from parts A and B. And finally, in part D, we're asked to use the p-value method to determine what the decision would be for all of the following values of alpha, 0 0.001, 0 0.005, 0 0.01, 0 0.05, and 0.1. So to answer this question, we start in part A, uh, as we've done before by uh, defining our key random variables here, or the key parameters of interest. Uh, we we let u, mu1 equal the mean house resale value in Palooka Town and mu2 equal the mean house resale value in Smallville. And those are the population parameters that we uh, don't have access to via census uh, to find out the actual values and therefore we can't find out with certainty the actual difference between them. So step one is to make the claim there there's a claim that there is no actual difference in average house resale value between the two towns and that is not once again as we've seen previously that's not a directional claim it's simply saying that the the difference is zero so we're talking about a two-tail test so step two we set up our hypotheses h naught that mu1 minus mu2 equals zero and ha that mu1 minus mu2 is not equal to zero. Step three, our level of confidence is 95%, so our alpha equals 0 0.05. Step four, our t obtained formula equals x bar one minus x bar two over the square root of s1 squared over n1 plus s2 squared over n2. Step five, the decision rule is based on alpha equals 0 0.05 and degrees freedom equals the minimum of 15 minus 1 and 12 minus 1, which equals 11. So for a two-tailed test, therefore, t critical equals plus or minus t of 0 0.025, which is 0 0.05 over 2, and 11, which rounds to plus or minus 2.201. And so the resulting decision rule is as shown in the diagram on the slide. In step 6, we calculate t obtained, it equals 265,500 minus 239,000, divided by the square root of 35,000 squared over 15 plus 21,000 squared over 12, which rounds to 2.435. And step seven, we can see that puts us into the right rejection region. So therefore we reject h naught that mu one minus mu two equals zero. 
Therefore, we can say that the sample data supports the alternative hypothesis, HA, that mu1 minus mu2 is not equal to zero. And finally, step eight, therefore, we reject the claim that there is no actual difference in average house resale value between the two towns. Furthermore, we can say that there is significant evidence from the data to suggest that mu1 is greater than mu2, i.e. that the average house resale price in Palooka Town is higher than in Smallville. For part B, we redo part A, this time for level of confidence equals 99%. So our alpha is now 0 0.01, and therefore we have a new T critical of plus or minus T at 0 0.01 over 2, which is 0 0.005 and 11, which gives us plus or minus 3.106. And as we can see on the revised decision rule diagram on the slide, our same value for T obtained of 2.435 now lies inside the non-rejection region. So therefore, we do not reject HO that the difference is equal to zero. In other words, we accept the claim that there is no actual difference in average house resale value between the two towns. In part C, we start by looking at the 95% and 99% confidence intervals for the difference in the two towns' average house resale prices as calculated previously. The 95% confidence interval goes from $2,549 to $50,451. And the 99% confidence interval goes from minus $7,299 to $60,299. Now, what's important here is the 95% confidence interval does not contain zero. It's entirely positive. And this confirms the hypothesis test decision at alpha equals 0.05 there, that there is, or in other words, at level of confidence 95%, that there is sufficient evidence to conclude that the average house resale price is greater in Palooka Town than in Smallville. Meanwhile, the 99% confidence interval does contain zero. It starts at a negative number and ends at a positive number which confirms the hypothesis test decision at alpha equals 0 0.01, in other words, at level of confidence 99%, that there is, that there is insufficient evidence to conclude that the average house resale price differs between the two towns. In part D, we proceed from the calculation of T obtained equals 2.435 for a two-tail test from part A. So there's an extract here from the T table on the slide. And we can see if we look in the DF equals 11 row that our obtained value of 2.435 falls between 2.201 and 2.718. And that corresponds to tail areas of 0 0.010 and 0 0.025. And so multiplying those by two because it's a two tail test, therefore our P value is between 0 0.02 and 0 0.05, which means that our P value is less than alpha for alpha values of 0 0.05 and 0 0.10. And our P value is greater than alpha for alpha values of 0 0.001, 0 0.005, and 0 0.01. So therefore, we reject H0 and the claim at levels of confidence of 90 and 95% and do not reject H0 and the claim at levels of confidence of 99, 99.5, and 99.9%. In example two, let's say that the same sample results, in other words, for X bar and S, from example one were obtained except that the sample sizes were different. N1 equals 37 instead of 15 and N2 equals 42 instead of 12. So our job here is to redo part D of example one under this scenario using the p-value method. So to answer this question we start by looking again at the uh, by looking at the revised uh, data, which is summarized in the table at right. It's similar to the previous table, but the n values have been changed, as mentioned in the in the problem. So the claim and the hypotheses from example one remain the same. However, we must now recalculate our t obtained because of the new n value. So we replace the n values uh, of 15 and 12, respectively, with 37 and 42, and we get a new t obtained equal to 4.013. 
And we also have to redo our degrees of freedom because now we've got, we're looking for the minimum of 37.1 and 42.1. Of course, that will be 37.1, which is 36. So we proceed with a T obtained of 4.013 for a two-tail test. And to get the, um, to figure out where in the table to look, you can see the extract from the table here now, we're looking in the DF equals 36 row. So that's what changes in terms of uh, looking in, looking this up in the tables that we're now looking in the, in a different row, which is the row for DF equals 36. And we notice that our obtained value of 4.013 is above the largest value in that row, which is 3.582. So I, we look up, and in this particular case, we see that we're going to, that means that our p-value will be less than 2 times 0 0.0005. In other words, the p-value is less than 0 0.001. So therefore, we would reject h naught at all of alpha equal 0 0.001, 0 0.005, 0 0.01, 0 0.05, 0 0 and 0 0.10. In other words, there's sufficient evidence at all levels of confidence up to and including the 99.9%, .9%, which is the highest one listed in the question, that the average house resale value is higher in Palooka Town than in Smallville. Hypothesis tests based upon paired samples proceed in a similar way as with independent samples, with the main difference being that there is really only one sample being analyzed, that of the differences between the corresponding pairs of before and after values. The hypotheses for the test in general are as shown in the slide below, and you can see that the only difference really between uh, the paired uh, test and the independent samples test is that we replace mu1 minus mu2 with mu d. And also, as with hypothesis tests based on independent samples, the most common value of the hypothesized difference is zero. In other words, the test is about whether or not there's any difference between before and after. So these are the tests that we'll focus on here, again, similar uh, as to with the independent samples. And so the general hypotheses of interest are those that you see on the slide below. And again, it's the same as with the independent samples, except we replace mu1 minus mu2 with mu d. Now, as with confidence intervals for differences between population means using paired samples, we use the t-distribution and the corresponding test statistic is as follows. We get t obtained equals d bar over sd over square root of n, which works out to be d bar times the root of n over sd. And we compare that t obtained against the critical value tc with degrees freedom here equaling simply n minus one, because again, there's just that one sample of differences. In example three, we return to the previous example of a company selling a brand of decaffeinated coffee. And in, in this particular example, we have the company making the claim that the drink has no effect on the heart rates of people who drink it. To test this claim, a group of 10 volunteer subjects is randomly selected and given a cup of this drink with their heart rates in beats per minute, BPM, measured before and after drinking it. The summarized paired sample results are below. It is assumed that the net change in heart rate tends to follow an approximately normal distribution. So in part A, we're to test this claim at alpha equals 0 0.01 against the sample data obtained using the critical value method. In part B, we're asked to explain how the calculation of the confidence interval for mu d at LOC equals 99% confirms the result from part A. And then in part C, we're asked to use the p-value method to determine a range of values for alpha over which the decision made in part A would remain unchanged. So our answers to these questions start as previously, now this is previous sample data that we were working with um, when we were looking at confidence intervals for paired data. And so we have n equals 10. We have d bar equal to the average difference, which is positive 1.2 beats per minute BPM. And our standard deviation works out to be the square root of 3,356 over 90. So for part A, we proceed in the usual manner. Step one, 
the claim is that the decaffeinated coffee has no effect on people's heart rates. Step two that gives us H naught is that mu D equals zero and H A that mu D is not equal to zero, a two-tailed test. Step three, our level of confidence is 99%, so alpha is 0 0.01. Step four, the formula for T obtained equals D bar times root N over SD. Step five, the decision rule is based upon alpha equals 0 0.01. Degrees freedom equals N minus one, which equals 10 minus one or nine. And so for a two-tailed test, therefore, T critical equals plus or minus T at 0 0.01 over 2, which is 0 0.005, and 9, which is plus or minus 3.250. Step 6, we calculate T obtained, which equals 1.2 times root 10 over the square root of 3356 over 90, which rounds to 0 0.621. And step seven, we can see with the decision rule that our T obtained therefore lies in the non-rejection region. Therefore, we do not reject H naught, that mu D is equal to zero. And finally, step eight, therefore, we accept the claim that this decaffeinated de coffee drink has no effect on people's heart rates. In part B, the 99% confidence interval for the average net change in heart rate resulting from drinking this coffee as calculated previously is a confidence interval that goes from minus 5.1 to 7.5. Now, since the 99% CI mu D contains zero, it confirms the hypothesis test decision at alpha equals 0 0.01 that there is insufficient evidence to conclude that drinking this coffee is associated with any net effect on the heart rates of people who drink it. In part C, with T obtained equal to 0.621 for this two-tailed test. We go to the DF equals nine row in the T table, and we see that T, our T obtained of 0.621 falls below the smallest T value of 0.883. So therefore, we can conclude that the P value is greater than two times 0 0.20. In other words, our p-value is greater than 0 0.40 and therefore for all alpha less than or equal to 0 0.40 our p-value will be greater than alpha and so therefore for all alphas less than or equal to 0 0.40 the decision from part a to accept the company's claim that the coffee drink has no effect on heart rates would remain the same we would therefore generally accept the company's claim for any typical or common alpha value, in other words, at all common levels of confidence. We now look at hypothesis tests comparing two population proportions. These tests address the null hypothesis that the difference between two population proportions, P1 minus P2, equals some hypothesized difference P1 minus P2 naught. So the hypothesis for this type of test in general are as shown below on the slide. And the only difference between these tests and the ones for the population means for independent samples is that instead of mu1 minus mu2, we use p1 minus p2. And as is the case with tests about differences between population means, the most common hypothesized difference between two population proportions is likewise zero. In other words, the purpose is to determine whether or not two populations actually have the same proportion. So therefore, the general hypotheses of interests are, as you see on the slide below, where we replace P1 minus P2 naught with the value zero. As with confidence intervals for differences between population proportions, we use the Z distribution, and the corresponding test statistic is as follows. We use Z obtained equals P bar one minus P bar two divided by the square root of, and you see this P tilde times one minus P tilde times one over N one plus one over N two. Now, P tilde is what we call the 
pooled sample proportion, and it equals x1 plus x2 over n1 plus n2. And the reason we use a pooled sample proportion is because the premise of the null hypothesis, which is that p1 minus p2 equals 0, is essentially the same as saying that the two population proportions are equal. So a single value based upon both samples is used for this calculation. In example four, a referendum is to be held in a community asking residents whether or not they want to discontinue fluoridation of the local water supply. One polling company hired by the Public Health Board published the results of a poll in which 60 people out of 150 surveyed indicated their support for the proposal. Meanwhile, another poll conducted by a local grassroots organization at the same time as the other poll recorded 144 people in support of the proposal out of 250 asked. In part A, it has been asserted by a member of the community that the two polls were effectively taken from two different populations because of what is alleged to be differences in the way that random selection was executed by the two polling teams. If it can be demonstrated using the polling data that there appears to be a difference between the two populations from which these surveys were taken, then that would in turn support a conclusion that these two polls do not reflect samples taken from the same overall community for which polling should have been targeted. Here, we're to test the community member's claim at LOC equals 95% using the critical value method. In part B, we're to use the p-value method to determine if there are any other relevant alpha values for which the conclusion from part A would be different. So to answer this problem, we start by defining a few things. So we let P1 equal the level of support for the no fluoridation proposal among the population randomly targeted in the Public Health Board sponsored poll. And P2 equals the level of support for this among the population randomly targeted in the local grassroots organization sponsored poll. So what we can do first is based on the poll results, we can go ahead and calculate the pooled sample proportion P tilde. So that equals x1 plus x2, which is 60 plus 144, divided by the sum of the sample sizes, which is 150 plus 250. So we get 204 over 400. So we get this pooled proportion, p tilde, of 0 0.51. <laughs> and then we proceed. In part A, we proceed in the usual manner. Step one, we have this claim, which is that the two polls actually targeted different populations instead of the same overall community relevant to the upcoming referendum. So what we can do is we can we can sort of rephrase this as being that the claim is that P1 minus P2 is not equal to zero. In other words, there's a difference between the two populations. So in step two, we, we, we rephrase that into our hypothesis. So we have H0 is that P1 minus P2 equals zero, while HA is that P1 minus P2 is not equal to zero. In step three, we have a level of confidence at 95%, so our alpha is 0 0.05. Step four, we're using the Z-obtained formula that we discussed previously. In step five, we have the decision rule based on alpha equals 0 0.05. And for a two-tailed test, we get Z-critical equals plus or minus the Z for 0 0.05 over two, which is 0 0.025 and that gives us plus or minus 1.960. Step six, we calculate our Z obtained, which equals 60 over 150 minus 144 over 250 and all that's over the square root of 0 0.51 times 0 0.49 times one over 150 plus one over 250, which works out to minus 3.409. And in step seven, we compare that with our decision rule, and we can see that our Z obtained it falls into the left rejection region. So therefore, we reject H naught that P1 minus P2 equals zero. Therefore, we can say that the sample data supports HA, that P1 minus P2 is not equal to zero. So finally, 
for step eight. Therefore, we accept the claim by the community member that the two polls were effectively from different target populations rather than from the same overall population which is relevant to the upcoming referendum. In part B, with our Z obtained equal to minus 3.41, that's now rounded to two decimal places. For a two-tailed test, we get a p-value equal to two times the phi of minus 3.41, which equals two times 0 0.0003 which equals 0 0.0006, which is quite a small number. Therefore, for alpha equal to 0 0.01, 0 0.005, and 0 0.001, the decision to reject H0 and accept the claim would be the same. The decision would only be reversed for alpha values less than or equal to 0 0.0006, and this is smaller than any commonly used alpha value. So generally speaking, we would make the same decision as in part A under any normal scenario. I hope that you found this video helpful. If you liked it and would like to see more from Ursa Campus, then please subscribe. And also, if you'd like to send your feedback, that's always welcome too. Thanks for watching, and I wish you well with your studies.